This video is proudly sponsored by the Magic Candle Company. Visit magiccandlecompany.com and use the new, the new offer code OFFHAND for 15% off of your purchase. Thank you to the Magic Candle Company for sponsoring this video. The magic we all know and love. The experiences you'll remember for a lifetime. Characters jumping off of the screen and into real life. And a vacation so good you'd swore you just wished upon a star. All of this, the magic found in the Disney parks, was the vision of one man to turn miles of wilderness into a highly themed, immersive entertainment experience. Where children of all ages could live their dreams. Where one could explore the wilds of Africa and enjoy the food of New Orleans all in one afternoon. This was the legendary 10-year plan of the original dreamer, the original doer, Michael Eisner. This is the story of the disastrous, but also pretty okay, Disney decade. Beginning in the 1990s, right after The Little Mermaid was released, the Disney decade was a gigantic expansion plan for all of the facets of what we know today as the Walt Disney Company. Park expansions, new movies, merchandise, licensing, Disney Quest, all of these were part of the Disney decade. And it, you know the story of Michael Eisner, you know how this all goes, but I figured we should start at the very beginning of the Disney decade. The Little Mermaid had come out the year prior. It was a massive success and a return to form for Disney and the CEO in charge, Michael Eisner, and his other half, president of the Walt Disney Company, Frank Wells, decided together that it was time to go pedal to the metal. Gone were the days of Oliver and Company and the Great Mouse Detective. In were the days of Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Animal Kingdom, and California Adventure. This was the Disney decade, and it all began here. This is where you ride monorails, star speeders, runaway trains, and fantasy boats. Where you travel back in time, into the future, and back to the present. Where some kind of wonderful magic warms the heart and uplifts the spirit. At the Walt Disney World Resort, enjoy the most unbelievable vacation on Earth. In 1990, the first plan started to formulate as to where Eisner wanted to take the parks over the next 10 years. Disney World, of course, had a lot of planned expansions, and for the most part, Disney followed through on a lot of these. But even more robust were the plans for Disneyland in Anaheim. It was time for it to undergo a complete metamorphosis from just a local theme park to an entire vacation resort. And that would all begin with, in 1991, a young Indiana Jones stunt spectacular. Sort of similar to the one over at Hollywood Studios, but this would be built behind Big Thunder Mountain, where Big Thunder ran was at the time where Galaxy's Edge is now. Because the third Indiana Jones movie, The Last Crusade, had come out in 1989 and was very popular, Disney was looking for a way to capitalize on that. And apparently their way of capitalizing on that was hiring young stunt actors to jump into a train car full of snakes. Uh, but I, I do have a confession though, I don't know if that stunt would be included, but it'd be a damn shame if it weren't. I need to see people jumping into bins of snakes at Disneyland after I ride Big Thunder Mountain, okay? Obviously this show never ended up materializing and what we got instead was just Big Thunder Ranch for another 30 years. But we eventually got Galaxy's Edge. And Han Solo appears on one of the toys at Toy Dairy and Toy Maker, which is essentially the same thing, right? Harrison Ford is here. It's just not a younger version of him at a stunt show. Disney liked the idea of having Indiana Jones representation at Disneyland, but the stunt show wasn't really what they were looking for, so they went back to the drawing board to come up with a brand new idea, something bigger, something better, something more intense that involved the guest directly. But that's for later on down the line. So while the stunt spectacular was canned for Disneyland over at Walt Disney Feature Animation, things were going a bit smoother. And by a lot smoother, I mean Beauty and the Beast was the first animated movie ever to be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. Disney didn't think their success could get any bigger after Little Mermaid, but Beauty and the Beast proved them wrong. They treated it like the piece of art it was, and immediately got to work on a Broadway musical adaptation featuring some cut songs from the original and some new ones. Meanwhile, over at Walt Disney World, construction was underway on the brand new Port Orleans Resort Hotels, and the Yacht and Beach Club and the Swan and Dolphin had already been complete 
No longer did guests have to leave Disney property to go to a convention or to stay at a sort of a more moderate themed hotel. Which also, by the way, alongside Caribbean Beach, which was built in the 80s, there were now moderate resorts at Walt Disney World, so if you didn't want to stay at the Grand Floridian or the Polynesian and spend all that money, you could stay at the Port Orleans or Caribbean Beach and spend a little bit less. And I do mean a little bit. They, they, they aren't much cheaper these days, at least. Alongside the expansion of resorts into the Walt Disney World Resort, the Magic Kingdom also got its very own semi-clone of Disneyland's Splash Mountain in 1992. I say semi-clone because it wasn't quite the same ride. It was the same ride, but it wasn't the same track. It wasn't the same experience. Anyone who's been to both knows, okay? There's a lap bar at Walt Disney World, whereas at Disneyland, you just gotta, you gotta hold on, okay? Pray you don't fall out. You're on your own. Meanwhile, over at Hall MGM Studios, over at Disney's MGM Studios, the best attraction ever created by Walt Disney Imagineering besides living with the land and the people mover and the Haunted Mansion opened Muppet Vision 3D. And Muppet Vision was only the first step into this collaboration between Michael Eisner and Jim Henson and Imagineering and the Muppets that was meant to see more additions over the course of the Disney decade, although, as we all know, the Muppets Great Movie Ride never ended up getting built. Still upset about that one. So overall, not a bad first two years for the Disney decade. There were some things that worked, some things that didn't work, but overall I'd give this like a, you know, 7 out of 10. It was fine. You're 20% of the way through now. You have eight more years to deliver on your promises. Michael, what are we doing next? Winter is coming. I think the, the guy from National Treasure said that. And what better gift on my friends to bestow than a holiday candle to set your home or office aglow? That's right, this video was sponsored by the Magic Candle Company. What better gift to get your favorite Disney adult than a candle that smells just like the Christmas shop? I, I mean, uh, the Christmas shop. If you've ever wanted to take home the smell of the Christmas parade to your very own home, you can with the Magic Candle Company. And as long as you use offer code offhand, you get 15% off your order. That's right, the code is now offhand. Maybe you're not quite into the holidays just yet and you'd like to celebrate Thanksgiving first. That's fine, you know, we can't all be perfect, so I, I got this for you. Here you go. This is the Floridian candle. It smells just like the lobby of the Grand Floridian during Thanksgiving time. Oh yeah, that's uncanny. They have room sprays if you don't like candles. They have bath products if you don't like room sprays. They have something for everyone. So what are you waiting for? Head over to themagiccandlecompany.com and use offer code OFFHAND for 15% off of your order. And a very big thank you to the Magic Candle Company for sponsoring this video. The Little Mermaid, Ariel, and her friend Sebastian the Crab will swim onto the scene in 1993. One year later, George Lucas returns to Disneyland with Alien Encounter. Yes, yes, you heard that correctly. Disneyland, George Lucas, Alien Encounter. Oh, this is gonna be a good two years. We'll start with The Little Mermaid. Back in 1993, Walt Disney Imagineering was developing a concept for a Little Mermaid attraction. Of course, the movie was a massive success, and they wanted some of that success in the parks as well. Originally, the ride was in development only for the Magic Kingdom and for Disneyland Paris. Nothing for Disneyland in Anaheim or Tokyo Disney. No, you didn't get Little Mermaid. Magic Kingdom, though, that... N you didn't get it either, actually. It never ended up happening. There is, however, a 3D sort of computer-generated ride-through of what this original Little Mermaid attraction was going to be that was included in some of the special features of Little Mermaid DVDs. Instead of what we ended up getting with the Omnimover clamshell sort of ride system, it was going to be a suspended dark ride similar to Peter Pan. The beats for the attraction were mostly the same. You would start above the sea, then go under the sea. The under the sea segment is almost exactly the same to what we ended up getting. There was, however, an extra scene with a giant Ursula in a whirlpool in a dark room filled with thunder and lightning. It was going to be kind of spooky, kind of scary, and kind of sad they didn't end up doing this. But as we know, Ursula gets destroyed or very faintly there in the background. You can see Ursula getting destroyed in the ride we have now. And then the boat and Ariel and Eric are waving to you and the ride is over. It's kind of, it's close, okay? This one looks a little higher budget, though. Maybe the Ariel animatronic would have been less frightening in this version. Of course, The Little Mermaid never ended up happening, but one thing that did end up coming to Walt Disney World is the extraterrestrial alien encounter. A sort of initiative from Michael Eisner to bring more teenagers into the parks. Originally, it was supposed to be based off of Ridley Scott's Alien, but they couldn't get a hold of the IP, so it just ended up turning into this guy. 
Originally, it was pitched as a replacement for Mission to Mars, which is where Alien Pizza Planet currently sits. Michael Eisner kept making it scarier and scarier before it was eventually shelved and it never ended up happening. Red Rocket's pizza port would open in 1998. Nowadays known as Alien Pizza Planet. Alien Encounter at Disneyland would have been part of a larger Tomorrowland overhaul, Tomorrowland 2055. You know, back when they wanted to do Tomorrowland overhauls. Weird. And concept art still exists of this proposed Tomorrowland 2055 that never ended up happening. Instead, we ended up getting a new steampunk Discovery Land sort of inspired Tomorrowland in 1998 because of all the budget cuts because of Euro Disneyland's complete and utter failure of an opening. This is what led to the green space mountain that they so wisely painted over. But while Alien Encounter was cancelled at Disneyland, it did end up making its way over to Walt Disney World, of course. The ride would open in 1995 and close in 2003, but it still remains on the forefront of a lot of vintage Disney fans' minds. For being the sort of one time Disney really didn't hold back when it came to scary and frightening imagery. Extraterrestrial Alien Counter would eventually go on to become Stitch's Great Escape, and Stitch's Great Escape would eventually go on to become empty. Meanwhile, over at Epcot, Communicore became Interventions and General Electric dropped their sponsorship for Horizons, which would eventually go on to spell disaster for the ride, but we're not there yet. And over at Hollywood Studios, the concept for a dark ride hotel fusion became just a brand new drop tower attraction called, of course, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, which would go on to become a crowd favorite and still stands relatively untouched to this day. So overall, compared to 1991 and 1992, the following two years actually were sort of a success. Plans changed, of course, and metamorphosized, but they did end up building things like extraterrestrial alien encounter, a sort of new Tomorrowland, the Tower of Terror, and of course, Little Mermaid. Things just changed and were shelved, but they did end up happening at some point. But now that Eisner was four years into the Disney decade, almost halfway through, he really had to start showing up and cranking up all of that Disney content to level 11, to, 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 to the highest gear setting possible in, in the gear shift, to the, to the max fidelity for Disney. He turned all of the attractions and movies to Wumbo. Aladdin had been released in late 1992 and was another slam dunk for the Walt Disney Animation Studios. And in 1994, The Lion King was released, and I don't even need to say anything. It was Disney's biggest success up until that point. Not adjusted for inflation, I think it's still Snow White, but still. Although there was one thing that threw a pretty significant wrench in all of Eisner's plans for the Disney decade, in 1994, Frank Wells passed away. Eisner and Wells often drew comparison to Walt and Roy, respectively. Where Eisner was the creative, the, the idea guy, Wells was very much the businessman keeping Eisner in line with what was actually financially possible and lucrative, and when they worked together, they were unstoppable-ish. And many people pinpoint this, 1994, as the beginning of the end for Eisner. Although I think it's safe to say he had a few more tricks up his sleeve before his tenure would end and Iger would take the reins. You see, in 1991, Eisner and Wells had developed an idea for a brand new Disneyland resort, and along with the building of new hotels, new attractions, there would be a second park. And the story of this second Disneyland park is as tragic as it is interesting. Because no, we weren't going to get Disney California Adventure, now known as Disney's California Adventure. Instead, Eisner and Wells developed a plan for a West Coast Epcot known, fittingly, as Westcott. And although plans were drafted up in 1991 and the years following, it all started to crumble in 1995. Welcome to our magical tour of the world's number one family vacation destination, Walt Disney World. It's 46 square miles of Disney fun in Central Florida, where the sun smiles down year-round. You're about to explore the Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and the Disney Studios. Dive into our incredible water parks. Discover our wonderful world of beaches, recreation, and entertainment. Plus, check into our vast selection of Disney resorts that cater to every fantasy and pocketbook. There's a world of excitement here for every member of your family, and you can pick and choose what you want to see and do as you go. 
As long as you don't want to see Animal Kingdom, that's not ready yet. A lot of things outside of the parks happened in 1995 at Walt Disney World, including the opening of the Wedding Pavilion and Disney's second water park, Blizzard Beach, giving families more things to do outside of going to the Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and Hollywood Stu uh, MGM. MGM Studios. Meanwhile, over at Disneyland, a lot of things were actually being opened. Toontown had opened the year prior, and the Indiana Jones stunt spectacular that was going to go back by Big Thunder Mountain had undergone a couple of changes. Now, it was an e-ticket, state-of-the-art dark ride that took over the Eeyore parking lot. Uh, by Eeyore. Of course, as we all know, the Indiana Jones adventure would go on to become one of the most popular and temperamental rides at the Disneyland Resort. Disney bought the Pan Pacific Hotel at the far end of the resort and renamed it to the Disneyland Pacific Hotel, probably confusing a lot of guests who wanted to stay at the original Disneyland Hotel. But, I mean, that was all going good. Meanwhile, over across the parking lot from Disneyland, though, the Westcott project was definitely not going well. Now, the entire plan for Westcott wasn't just a replica of the second best park Disney has ever made. It was much more than that in its original incarnation. There was a brand new hotel, there was a new shopping center that was going alongside the hotel and theme park. It eventually just became Downtown Disney, but it was a thing. But Westcott was going to be a condensed version of Epcot, and I could go into more explanation, but I've made videos about Westcott before, so I'm going to put a card right there in the corner of the screen for you to, to learn more, to go more in-depth on what the actual theme park was going to be, and it's a darn shame it never happened. As a massive Epcot fan, I would love, 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 love to have Westcott. But uh, eventually, for a multitude of reasons, including the failure of Euro Disneyland, which opened in 1992, and some pushback from the locals, Westcott had to be downsized. Eventually, Westcott was quietly cancelled after being announced officially by Disney, and Eisner and a bunch of other Disney executives were playing around with the idea of another second park, maybe buying Knott's Berry Farm. Okay, no, probably a bad idea. Disney Sea. Nah, that's nah, it's a terrible idea. Nobody wants to go to Disney Sea. <laughs> Why? Where would where would Disney Sea even be successful? Oh. Eventually, at a retreat in my beautiful home state of Colorado, Eisner and his executives came up with the idea of a California-themed park in California. But DCA opened in 2001, so you are not part of the Disney decade. We're only going up until 2000. You missed the window, DCA. You missed the window. Okay, so the second park in California would have to go back to the drawing board, but there was a fourth park, an idea for a brand new park at Walt Disney World that did end up happening. One that brought Walt Disney's original idea for the Jungle Cruise at Disneyland to the next level, with real animals showcasing different conservation methods and their natural habitats. This would become Disney's Animal Kingdom. Disney's next three animated movies wouldn't quite capture the magic of The Lion King or Beauty and the Beast or The Little Mermaid before it. It would be Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Hercules. I mean, and all of these movies, I think, are pretty good. Hercules especially. I absolutely love Hercules. Still, it was no Lion King. And it is because of Euro Disneyland and the cancellation of Westcott and these three movies not quite being the Lion King they were hoping they would be, the Disney decade began to falter. But in 1996, Michael Eisner had planned for a brand new, state-of-the-art, hyper-immersive dark ride at Disneyland Park. One that would revolutionize the theme park industry based off of the extremely popular franchise that Disney now owned, Dick Tracy's Crime Stoppers. Yeah, no, uh, Rise of the Resistance wouldn't happen for a while. 1996. Dick Tracy's Crime Stoppers, combining state-of-the-art technology with a classic story from the past. Crime Stoppers was meant to be a sort of mix between Indiana Jones and Dinosaur later on and Astro Blasters or Space Ranger Spin, having the same sort of ride vehicle as Indiana Jones and Dinosaur while also being a laser gun shooting gallery type attraction like Buzz Lightyear over in Tomorrowland. See, I said that because that could, that could count for both. But because the Dick Tracy movie was a commercial and critical complete an utter flop, the ride was quietly shelved and then eventually cancelled. So if you're wondering why nowadays Disney tends not to announce projects before they're certain and set in stone, minus, you know, all the COVID stuff, these two. These two are why. Good morning. When Walt Disney first dreamed up what was to become Disneyland, he was imagining something unprecedented, a completely new form of entertainment where he could tell three-dimensional stories. Six Disney theme parks have opened. 
including the Magic Kingdom, Epcot Center, Disney MGM Studios here in Florida, each an original entertainment concept. When we started conjuring up a fourth theme park at Walt Disney World, we knew we had to come up with something that set itself apart, something that was novel and distinct. We considered a number of ideas, but the theme that kept topping the list was the world of animals. Okay, well, he got this one right, okay? Animal Kingdom, I think it's safe to say, was, uh, was a success. Such a success that they haven't built another theme park at Walt Disney World since then, so... Yay. But not everything was going smoothly. Over at the animation studios, the Disney Renaissance was winding down. Mulan was out. Tarzan was out. And the movie after that was uh, a Fantasia 2000. Now, don't get me wrong, I love me some Rhapsody in Blue. But then, it be, you know, being followed up by Dinosaur, you know, the, the, the studios weren't doing too hot. Originally planned for Hollywood Land, the same land where Dick Tracy would have gone at Disneyland. Back in the early 90s, there was a plan for a Roger Rabbit attraction, which was eventually cancelled, or retooled, I should say rather, into Cartoon Spin, which you can find at Toontown. So with the movie studio underperforming, Animal Kingdom being a relative success, and Euro Disneyland still kind of squandering over there in France, Eisner gave it one last Hail Mary, one last good try with Disneyland's second park, not Westcott, not Disney Sea but Disney California Adventure. And, you know, y you know. Over at Animal Kingdom, the planned second phase was canceled. This was gonna contain Beastly Kingdom, which eventually sort of made its way over to Universal. The Israel and Soviet Union pavilions for Epcot's World Showcase were canceled. And overall, it was looking like Disney's successes throughout the 90s were coming to an end, and the company was beginning to stagnate again. Just like what happened all the way back in 1966 when Walt died. Eisner had given the company that shot in the arm. It had given it a good 10 years of prosperity and popularity, but that was slowly dwindling down and the executives over at Disney were becoming very unhappy with Eisner. W wait is he holding a chimp? Maybe the future rested with the man in charge of the international wing of the Walt Disney Company, a young upstart named Bob Iger, or maybe even uh, the marketing director of Disney Home Entertainment, a man named Bob Chapek. The Disney Company wouldn't see a shakeup for a few more years to come, but 2000 is where the Disney decade ends. Now, of course, I've skipped over a few things, but overall, the Disney decade, while it didn't quite transform the landscape of Disneyland as much as they were hoping it to, Disney World really, really got a boost. All of the hotel rooms, the brand new theme park, new attractions, all of that sort of made Disney World even more of a vacation destination. And while Disneyland didn't get the gigantic Westcott everyone was hoping for, or Hollywood Land, or all of these new e-ticket dark rides, besides, you know, maybe Indiana Jones, it did go from Disneyland, this one park that you can park in front of, walk up to, and enjoy your day at, to the Disneyland Resort, with two hotels now, and a third under construction, and a giant hole in the ground, a big mountain of dirt that would one day become California Adventure. Very soon, in fact. I think it's easy to look at the failures of the Disney decade, the things that never ended up getting built, like like Westcott, and say it was a failure. But if you compare that to what's happening with the parks nowadays, I think a lot of people would prefer all of the money that was going into the parks back then to be, you know, sort of going into what we have now. While Eisner was shooting for the stars, he certainly landed on the moon, not quite as far as he wanted to go, but I wouldn't say it was a failure. Except for, you know, not building Westcott. That was, that was a massive, massive loss. Overall, I think there are three factors as to why the Disney decade started to falter about halfway through, and that is Euro Disneyland absolutely bombing, Frank Wells is passing, and Michael Eisner being too ambitious with the expansion. We can only wonder if Euro Disneyland had been a success, would we, after all that happened and all that transpired with the locals and the businesses in Anaheim, would we have gotten Westcott? I don't know. We might have, but the timeline that we are in, the DCA that we have nowadays, I, I think it's alright. I actually really like California Adventure, what it turned out to be at least. But what about you? Do you think the Disney decade was a failure, a success, or somewhere in the middle? Because while I very much think Michael Eisner's heart was in the right place with this whole massive rapid expansion plan for the parks, I'm also kind of glad we never ended up getting Dick Tracy's Crime Stoppers. That would have... Why? But we did end up getting things like the Tower of Terror and Indiana Jones, so I mean, I would count that as a win. But the story of Disney from 1990 to the year 2000 goes to show that the company sort of goes through its ups and downs, and while we may not be super satisfied with the state of the parks right now, it's not impossible that another golden age is right there on the horizon. So uh, just re remember that when they announce that the Play Pavilion is completely cancelled, okay? Just keep that in mind.
Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to this episode of Offhand Disney. I hope you enjoyed it. We were talking about the Disney decade. Like I said, I skipped over a few things. There were a couple attractions, a couple expansions, and hotels, you know, the whatnot that I didn't talk about. I wanted to cover, like, the main story beats of this, though. Eisner was our protagonist. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, and if you're new around here and you want more videos about Eisner, of course, who doesn't love a nice Michael Eisner story, hit the subscribe button. A very special thank you to all of my supporters over at Patreon.com. Even just $1 a month will get you access to most of the perks, like video sneak peeks, and sometimes early access to entire videos early. That, I guess that, that's what early access means. They're the ones who help keep this channel going, so a massive, massive thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. Also, you have to watch the Foolish Morals podcast. That's not a request, that's, a, that's an assignment. You have to watch it. We talk about everything from Disney cruises to the Haunted Mansion to new Epcot attractions and everything in between. So if that interests you and you want to see me and Dan talk for an hour about nothing in particular, head over to his Twitch channel. It's the Submarine Canteen. It will be linked in the description down below. And lastly, be sure to follow me on all of my social medias. I am at Offhand Disney on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Follow me over at TikTok. You get exclusive Offhand Disney videos that you do not get over here on YouTube. I don't know how to use the shorts feature yet. Maybe I'll do some of them over here sometime, but, but not yet. Maybe we'll get another Disney decade sometime soon. Maybe starting 2030, we'll get the Disney decade part two, and I get to make a, a whole other video on it 20 years later. So that'd be, what, 2050? Okay, yeah, I have my work cut out for me. Everyone, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next entry to the offhand Disney saga. Goodbye.